Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be with you. Happy Fourth of July weekend. Hopefully, you had a great weekend. And uh, for those of you who came out and hung out on the beach with us on Fourth of July, it, it was a, a really great time to hang out with. Us. I think we had over 200 and some people from Seacoast kind of took over right there in the middle, which was a really a great morning. And uh, so, uh, it, and if you weren't able to be there, we trust that you had a great time with your friends and family wherever you were celebrating. Um, before we say anything more, I do want to just give a shout out to our young adults uh, who mostly put on the event for the rest of us. I look over here, there's probably some over here too, but uh, thank all of you guys who have participated. You know, I know a lot of them, they said, oh yeah, we love getting up at 5 a.m. So... Um, they got up at 5 a.m. and staked out the place on the beach and made just a really fun day for, for the rest of us. So thank you guys, everyone who made that happen. Uh, we are in a series called In Good Company, and what we're doing is looking through stories of people uh, throughout Scripture, and what we want to do is find what are the grace that we can find in our lives today as we understand more and more about who our God is based on his interactions or how he uses people uh, for his glory and, and how people respond to him. And so this series, as we're looking through all these different characters, what we don't want to do is get to the point where we say, okay, here's a lot of stuff to live up to. That there's, you know, can we have, can we be mighty warriors like David and have the faith of Daniel? And can we, you know, all of these different characters, there's a temptation to look at all of them and think, wow, if only I could be like all of these people, then God will be pleased with me. But what we really want to do is the more we study these different people, we want to have it point us back to that who God is and what he says about us and to find grace for our lives today as we look through their lives. And, and so, and we're going to find, and what we have been finding is these are people a lot like you and me. And though they've had some great moments sometimes recorded in scripture, they also have some lowlights recorded in scripture, but they're people like you and like me. And I wonder if you were to think back in your life, who are the people that have made a difference in your life? What are the little moments that have gotten you where you are today? As I think through my story, and I don't know if you've ever kind of drawn the map of your life, kind of where you're born and the people you've met, and growing up as a military kid, my map is all over the map, literally and figuratively. And I think of that, and sometimes I look back and think, there's some significant moments and times with people that have stood out that have led me to where I am today. And that is what we find in the lives of a lot of people that we study in scripture. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at the life of someone who I think is a little bit unique in, in scripture. And maybe a story that some of you haven't heard before or it's been a while. Uh, today, today's message is called Palm Trees and Tent Pegs. Speaks for itself, I know. So... So we're going to look at this story in there, and it's in the book of Judges. So I want to invite you to find the book of Judges, and it's uh, t near the beginning. It's the seventh book in the Bible, so it's kind of near the beginning there, and we'll look at the story. But as we get there, let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning, and I thank you for all of the small moments in our lives that have led us to where we are today. Lord, I thank you for the people and the conversations and the stories, for all the events, the tough events that have gone on the victorious events, the, the moments, Lord, where we saw you really shine that have led us to this place, God. Even the moments where we don't know what you're up to. Lord, we thank you for all these things because we know that you're at work. And for anyone who's here this morning, Lord, there's some who are here with heavy hearts. I pray this morning you would speak freedom and peace into their lives and to every one of us, God. And as we look at the life of some of the characters in scripture today, Lord, let us find truth about you and be reminded of who you are and who you say we are today. So we thank you and we pray that these words would be yours and we'd all hear what we need to hear from you today. So we give you this time in Jesus' name, amen. So we are in the book of Judges. Now, some of you, if you're not familiar with scripture, or maybe if you uh, have your assumptions about faith, and you hear that there's a book in the Bible called Judges, you say, oh, there it is. This is what I think about faith. It's all about judging, and, and this is where God lays the hammer down, and, and this is what it's all about. Well, let me just kind of ruin that for you really quick. Judges is essentially a season in the history of Israel before they had kings, 
And judges were the people who had led them. And now this wasn't, these weren't like the Supreme Court judges or someone who was nominated and appointed, but these were people who, through circumstances in their lives, rose up into the ranks of leadership. And for a series or a period of time, they were leaders in the nation of Israel. They weren't elected, they weren't appointed. People just followed them for one reason or another. Now, before we get to today's story, I also want to let you know, in the book of Judges, we're introduced to this cycle in the nation of Israel of something that keeps happening in their lives. And this is a cycle where they will follow the Lord for a season of, or a period of time. And for one event or another, their hearts kind of start to wander away. And it says that they give their hearts over to other gods, to other idols. And then they experience the consequences of that. They cry out to God. He raises up a leader for them, one of the judges, who will then kind of steer them back in the direction of following the Lord. They experience a season of that renewed uh, heart for the Lord. And then once again, the cycle repeats itself. They see their lives and their hearts wander away. And we, we find this cycle in the history of Israel repeats over and over again throughout the king, the period of the kings and probably really to this day. And it's not unlike many of our lives, the own cycle of our faith, where we have a season of just this kind of closeness with God that sometimes then we drift away for one reason or another. But what we find here in the story today is God often sends people or circumstances that bring our hearts back. And that's what we want to look at and see what is that truth. And in our stories, as we wander away, notice how God brings us back because his heart is for us. And so that's what we want to see here today. But to see, just to prove my point here, in Judges chapter 2, let me just give you a couple verses that will introduce the cycle here in in the book of Judges. So verse 16 of chapter 2 says this, The Lord raised up judges who saved them, the Israelites, out of the hand of raiders. They did not listen and they gave themselves over to other gods and worshiped them. So God would raise up a judge, would lead them, would deliver them, and they'd give their hearts over to other gods. And, and these were mostly the gods of the Canaanites and just many different idols in their lives. Um, verse 18 says this, Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge and saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord had compassion on them as they groaned under those who oppressed and afflicted them. So again, God's heart was for his people. And when they experienced this kind of oppression or affliction or life apart from God, they would groan and cry out to God and God would send someone into their lives that would draw them back. And that's kind of the cycle that continues over and over again in their lives. So today what we look at is when God raises up one of the judges. So turn over to Judges chapter 4. And we're going to look at a character who maybe is not all that well known for you. And what I want to do is what are the principles that we learn about life in the kingdom of God through this character? And how, does that, how do we find grace for today? So first of all, the, chapter 4 verse 1. The sons of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Cana, Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harashoth Hagaim. Guys got it? All right, cool. <laughs> the sons of Israel carried, or cried out to the Lord, for, he, for Sisera had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. So here's the scene that we have right now. So their hearts are gone away. Now they're being led by, or conquered by the Canaanites. And this commander of the army of the Canaanites was this guy named Sisera. And it says he has 900 iron chariots. Now, the significance of that, sometimes in scripture we have numbers that are symbolic. Sometimes they're literal. Uh, We don't know whether this is, 900 is obviously a lot either way. But it's such an odd number, it probably was likely that he has this giant force. Now, the significant thing here is they're iron chariots. Or chariots that are made with iron, at least on some parts of them. This was a technological advancement that the Israelites did not have. And so it's mentioned because the Israelites, when they saw this army, would feel like this is, this is like we're going into battle with slingshots and they have tanks coming at us. That's how it felt to them. This, their technology is far superior. Their forces are far superior. And now we're being oppressed for 20 years. So that's the scene. Now verse 4. Now Deborah... A prophetess, the wife of Lapidot, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah 
in Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. The sons of Israel came to her for judgment. Now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali. Oh, just keep all these names straight here. And said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and, ma- and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and from the sons of Zebulun. And I will draw you out to Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. So here's the scene that we have. We're introduced to this character named Deborah. Now, she's a unique character in scripture. Uh, She's unique that she's one of the first judges over the nation of Israel. And I don't know if you notice or not, but it's a female leader. And, And notice how descriptive the Bible is about how she rose up into her leadership and all that. It's not. It just, it, there's no explanation. It just says Deborah was leading. She was judging Israel at the time. She was a leader. It's significant to know that this was not necessarily cultural or counterculture in the Middle East, ancient Near East. There were some Assyrians. Often you'd see some uh, queens rise up. But for Israel, this was unique. It was unique in their history. But God, there's no fanfare. There's no description. There's no explanation. It's just Deborah was judging Israel at the time. And I wonder what it was like for Deborah when we see this, when we hear about her. I wonder if she felt, I don't know if I'm qualified, I wonder what other people are thinking about me, or if she just rises up. And the first thing that we see in the story that I believe that we find in Deborah that God wants us to know here is that you have a fit in God's kingdom. You fit in God's kingdom somewhere. That God has created you, he has gifted you, And he has prepared you for life in his kingdom. That God has designed you, I used the wrong word, God has designed you, gifted you, and prepared you for life in his kingdom. For Deborah, he was designed, gifted, and prepared for life in his kingdom for that moment. And it's very easy for us to look at our lives and and make a lot of excuses. We could say, well, you know what, I'm I'm too young to make a difference or to be used by God. I'm too old. Life has moved on. People have moved on. You could say, I don't have enough training, enough education. I don't have the right gifting to be used in the kingdom of God. I'm not that significant. I was, you know, whatever it might be, but we find in the life of Deborah that God is pointing to the fact that he uses all kinds of different people and all kinds of different situations. And he has designed, gifted, and created you and prepared you for life in his kingdom. That you and your life is not a mistake. And the things you've gone through is not a mistake. They are not a mistake, the things that you've gone through. Your background is not a mistake. Your history, your family of origin, it's not a mistake. God has a fit for you in his kingdom. And don't downplay who you are and how you are gifted, that your gifting matters to God. Deborah was faithful. She, it just says that she judged Israel. People would come to her for judgment. She was sitting under the palm tree. Palm tree there represented, uh, probably represented fairness and uh, impartiality. But there's a place that became known as the palm tree of Deborah, a symbol of her faithfulness to God. She was just living out her gifting right there and more and more people were coming and starting to follow her leadership to the point where she was a leader over most of the tribes in Israel. They acknowledged her leadership. And she didn't, it wasn't, there was nothing else about, oh, but she's a female, should we be following her? No, they were like, we are lead, God is using her to lead us in this. I recently was reading a book called Introverts in the Church. Now, uh, introverts, where are you all? Raise your hand. Let's go. Hey, woo. No, just kidding. A few of you did it. That's good. (laughs) Extrovert. No, we won't do that. We won't do that. But it's really easy in the church, and and the book really talks about, we've done a disservice sometimes in the church that almost to say, hey, those who are really faithful to God are extroverts. Because if you're faithful to God, when you worship, you're probably going to be raising your hands. You're probably, when you get a a preacher is really going, you're probably going to yell out an amen. Uh, When you're sitting by someone on the plane, you're going to share your faith with that person. And when you're at the beach on 4th of July, you're going to meet, you're going to invite other people into your circle. And you're just going to kind of, that's what a life of someone faithful to the Lord will do. 
And, and, and we kind of have that story, and then all of you introverts are thinking, oh man, I don't know if I want to have a life being faithful to the Lord, if that's what it looks like. And it, in the church, sometimes we do a disservice to a very gifted, important population, which is actually statistically more than half of us are introverts. And it's, have, we have this history where sometimes those who are introverted would think, I don't have a place in God's kingdom because when I'm on the plane, I'm putting on my headphones and I'm not preaching to the person next to me. Because if I start talking to them too early, they're going to talk to me the entire flight. And that is not how I want to start my trip. Anyone with me right now? You guys get it? Yeah. I'm an ambervert. I can go either way. And on the planes, I'm an introvert. I don't need to talk to you. I will ask you when we're getting up at the end, so are you... Coming home or going on a vacation? That's it. like, don't ask it too early because you're going to ruin my flight. So, <laughs> and you ever have that person, you ever kind of put the, never mind. All right. <laughs> put the headphones in, you kind of act like you're sleeping because you know you're by a talker. Yeah. Just wait for them to start talking to the person on the other side of them and then you're good, good to go. So, but introverts, you matter to God in the kingdom of God. You have a place, you have a role. Those of you who don't like public speaking, you have a role in the kingdom of God. Those of you who are not musically talented, you have a role in the kingdom of God. Those of you who, who love working in the nursery, you have an important role in the kingdom of God. We all, you're, you are designed, gifted, and prepared by God for life in the kingdom. I don't care what your story is. You belong. You have a fit in the kingdom of God. Deborah belonged right where she was. And often, when we're faithful in life under the palm tree, just be faithful where you are, and God can use it in many, many ways that maybe you didn't know. We didn't, I don't know if Deborah knew what God was preparing her for, for that moment, but she was faithful in those moments under the palm tree. What is the palm tree in your life? Where are the places where God has placed you where you can be faithful? For some of you, that's going to be your workplace. Be faithful there. Maybe it's in your neighborhood, your reputation with your neighbors. Maybe for some of you, it is in the local coffee shop where you hang out more than you want to admit to the rest of us. Maybe for some of you, you're a stay-at-home parent. And you think, oh, I'm just, you know, it's insignificant. I, I'm not making money. No, be faithful where God has placed you because you fit in the kingdom of God wherever you are. If you're a business owner, if you are the lowest person on your org chart, you have a fit in the kingdom of God. Be faithful where you are. If you're a student, you have a fit in the kingdom of God. God wants to use you where you're at. He wants to work in your life. We find that with Deborah. Chuck Swindoll says it this way. Because God gave you your makeup. He's designed you as who you are. And he's in he intends every moment of your past, including all the hardship, the pain, and the struggles. He wants to use your words in a unique manner. No one else can speak through your vocal cords, and equally important, no one else has your story. So what we find in the life of Deborah is that her story mattered, and it was different than others. She had a fit in the kingdom of God. She fit in as well as you do and I do to this day. So what do we see, what happens next in her life? So she's judging under the palm tree. She calls out to this guy named Barak, who was a, a, a commander in one of the military tribes there in Israel. And let's jump back to verse six. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, and said to him, behold, the Lord God of Israel has commanded you to go and march to Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Natali and the sons of Zebulun, and I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him, or, or excuse me, give him over into your hand. And Barak said to her, "If you will go with me, then I will go; but if you will not go with me, I will not go." She said, I'll surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went, back, went, went with Barak to Kadesh. And they called the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with him. And Deborah also went up with him. The next thing that we see in Deborah's life is that you have an impact 
in the kingdom of God. Notice what went on here. She called out to Barak and said, hey, God has a word for you. The word is go and he will draw out the army of Sisera, which by the way, if you're sent into battle and said, here's God's plan. You're gonna go there and God's gonna draw this mighty army towards you. They're gonna come out after you. So go, have fun, go get them. But then she said, God's going to give them over into your hands. And notice the response by the commander of the army, this warrior. Uh, I'll go if you go with me. If you don't go, I'm not going. And we hear this in the story and we find that we have a, often have an impact in God's kingdom that far outreaches what you could ever imagine. Sometimes your faith can be someone's foundation. The foundation of someone else's faith is sometimes based on yours. Now, we don't want people to build their faith or you have you as their foundation. We want it to be Jesus. But there are seasons and times when your faith in God becomes the foundation for somebody else. And here we have Deborah who had this belief and faith in what God was going to accomplish and her faith was the foundation for Barak's success in this moment. And it it makes me think of all the people in my past who have made a difference in my life, maybe without knowing it, but their faith became a foundation, a building stone in my life. I've told you the story of the times when I I became a Christian and the first time I ever went to a youth evangelistic event, uh, my parents made me go to it. And it was on a Saturday and I hated, I was like, I'm not going to a church on a Saturday, are you kidding me? But I had to go. So um, I went that Saturday morning and When I walked into this event, one of the first things that happened is I saw a kid who went to my high school who saw me, and he said, hey, Ryan, what are you doing here? And I was wondering the same thing, is what I said to him, like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. And he said, why don't you come and sit with us in the youth group? Now, those are very small words, a small moment. I bet if I called him today and said, hey, do you remember that day? He would probably say, who is this again? (laughs) And if he remembers who I am, I doubt he remembers that day. And if he remembers that day, I doubt he remembers that conversation. But to me, that conversation was a foundation. His faith in Jesus that day was a foundation for mine that would later come. Because if I didn't run into him and he didn't invite me to sit with them, I think I would have lasted about 10 minutes and I probably would have been out the back door. I don't think I would have stuck around. And I didn't plan on meeting him there. He just saw me and said, come sit with us. Now at the time, he didn't tell me they were sitting in the front row. That would have been a different story. I'm glad I didn't know at the time. But you never know what your words or what your life, the impact that you can make, but know that you have an impact in the kingdom of God. Your life is not too insignificant to make a difference. Your words are not too insignificant to make a difference. You are where God has you. He's designed you and you can make a difference in the kingdom of God right where you are. We find that in the life of Deborah. When you're willing, she was willing to put her faith into action and that became the strength for for Barak to go with her. I remember when I was starting off in youth ministry and uh, we used to go on, uh, kind of ran most of our own summer camps and winter camps. And there was a couple from our church who they loved to cook. They just loved to cook. And so we went on our first trip and it was at a a camp up in in the mountains in Washington. And we had a huge kitchen there and I don't even know how we got them invited. They came and, and they made the food for us and they came back and said, can we do summer camp for you? like, oh, yeah, great. Anytime a youth pastor can book something out more than three months in advance, that's called advanced planning. That's really good. So, so we booked them, and, and it got to the point where every year, it, I didn't even have to tell them. They would just say, how many kids are going? And I'd say, 60. Okay. And they'd show up. I'd show up at the camp, and all the food was there. It was prepared. It was their heart. They loved to cook. They loved to be there. But again, if I asked them today, Do you remember any of those camps? They might say, well, I have something about it. But I bet you if I asked the students who went and the dozens and dozens of kids who gave their life over to the Lord being at those camps, if they remembered them, I bet they would. So you have an impact in the kingdom of God and it might be because you love to cook and you want to hang out with our youth for a full week somewhere. Hint, hint. And uh, 
And God can use that impact. That is not insignificant in the kingdom of God. Your life is not insignificant. So what else do we see in the story of Deborah? So Barak said, I'll go if you go. So she went. Now here's the rest of the story. We're going to have a lot of names here. I'm going to skip some of them just so you can track with us a little bit. But we introduce a third character or a third, third dynamic here. It says, Haber, the Canaanite, had separated himself from the Canaanites, from the sons of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses. Okay, great. And he pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zananim. Okay, well, then they told Sisera, this is a little parenthesis, introducing character that's popping back up. Now, they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera called together all his chariots, 900 iron chariots, and all the people who were with him, from Harosheth, Hagoim, to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Arise, for this is the day which the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Behold, the Lord has gone out before you. So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with 10,000 men. And the Lord routed Sisera and his, all his chariots and his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harashoth Hagayim. And all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. Not even one was left. So notice what's happening here. Now, we don't get all the details. We just know they all started falling. Now, chapter 5, we're not going to get into it. It's called the Song of Deborah. Gives us extra details. And what we really find here is when the Israelites went out and this mighty army was coming against them, the Israelites came down on one side of a mountain and there was a river between them. And when all these chariots went to attack them, the river had flooded recently, according to the story in, in chapter 5, according to the song, and the chariots all got stuck in the mud. And so what was their great strength became their greatest weakness, Israel had delivered, or God had delivered them into the hands of the Israelites. And notice here, this is one thing that we see that pops up over and over again here. Your power in God's kingdom is not your power, but it's his. Notice she says in verse 6 and 7 that God will hand, deliver the army into your hands. Verse 14, go, this is the day the Lord has given you. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? And we find in the kingdom of God that it's about his power at work, not yours. God will use unlikely things. Let's look at the, the rest of the story. Now, Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Haber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin and the, and the house of Heber. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my master, turn aside to me. Don't be afraid. And he turned aside to her and went into the tent. She covered him up with a rug, hiding him. And he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink. Then she covered him. That is just a bizarre detail. I don't know why it's in there. It doesn't make, give me some water. He gave her, she gave him some kefir, basically. Uh, they used to drink this fermented milk. And then he said to her, stand in the doorway of the tent and it shall be if anyone comes and inquires of you and says, is there anyone here? You shall say no. But Jael, Haber's wife, took a tent peg, seized a hammer in her hand, went secretly to him and drove the tent peg into his temple and it went through to the ground for he was sound asleep and exhausted. So he died. Okay, kids, Sunday school time. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is one of those stories. I remember when my dad was stationed at the Presidio in San Francisco, I had to go to the uh, the base chapel Sunday school every week. And we had this Sunday school teacher when I was a fourth grade boy. He taught fourth grade boys. And every week he would read a story and we got this big piece of paper and got to draw a picture of it. I remember this story from that moment. <laughs> and I think he just kept reading stories from the book of Judges because he's like, they're finally listening. Um, the book of Judges has many of these kinds of stories. And again, we look at this and think, what, what's going on here? Now, there's all kinds of countercultural things that just happen there. For someone to go into the tent and, and have a, a woman invite this man into the tent was countercultural. That wouldn't have happened. And for, it wasn't common. And for him to say, hey, you stand guard for me, that would be unusual for him to do that. And then for her to take the tent peg, the thing that she knew, she probably uh, was very skilled at breaking down these tents and pitching tents strong enough to grab a hammer, 
Yeah, you get the picture, the rest of the story. And we find that God uses some unusual things, and we don't know anything else about her life. She wasn't a follower of the Lord that we know of, but God prompted the events to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish that day. We find that in God's kingdom, it's not your power, it's God's power at work. The battle is the Lord's. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 30, speaking specifically to the Israelites, but I believe the principle applies to us, says, the Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight on your behalf, just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes. We know that God goes before us, and when it's his mission, he's the one who will fight for us. And again, we're not talking about fighting against other armies and defeating people. We're talking about facing things in life. That it's often that we put the pressure on ourselves to perform. We think if we don't say the right words, someone may wander away from the Lord. We think as parents, if we make one mistake with our kids, they may never follow Jesus again. We put these pressures on ourselves and think that it's our, uh, our need to control the hearts and the lives of everyone around us. And the truth is God reminds us that he's the one at work. And in God's kingdom, it's his power at work. God will fight the battle and the pressure to see God move in and around you is his pressure, not yours. It's God's pressure to make something of your life, not yours. This should remove the burden from us to always perform and be perfect. Let God use you where you are with your unique giftedness, your skills, your background, how he's prepared you, and trust the results in God's hands. And that's the best place they can possibly be. I often talk about the pressure I feel uh, and, and most people feel when you're in a position in ministry and you have a church and every time you teach, the scorecards come out. You know you have them. You, get, you talk about them on your way home. You rate the sermon. You rate the music, right? Oh, it was a little off today, but you know. And if you don't, my wife does. So I know how it goes. So. But it's been one of the greatest things in my life to learn that my job is to do my best to prepare, to present, and to trust God to change hearts and lives. I will never be able to change people's hearts and lives. The Holy Spirit of God will. You can't change your coworkers' lives. You can't even make those decisions for your kids. You could trust God to fight that battle for you because it's his, it's not yours to fight. And there's so much freedom in that when all we do is say, God, we have a place in your kingdom. We, we can have an impact in your kingdom no matter who we are, but ultimately it's up to you, Lord. The pressure's on you to make a difference, not me. And that's the greatest place that we can be. So how do we respond? What can we do? I want to just point to you to Romans chapter 12, the beginning of it. I love this. Actually, Romans 11 ends with this. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. So Romans 11 ends with, with Paul writing and say, we don't always understand the heart of God, but he's so much greater than we could imagine. His mercy is so much more merciful than we could imagine. His love is so much more, ex extends further than we could ever imagine. His judgments are more pure than we could. Just everything about God, we, we can't even fathom how great he is. And then chapter 12, verse one, he says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, in view of this great God, I urge you, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Now we can get into what that looks like and there's full sermons about it. But essentially what it means is God, all we can offer you is our lives the way they are. I offer you, me, with my background, my education, my family of origin, my history, my mistakes, my failures, my challenges. God, I just offer that to you. And that is described as a pleasing sacrifice. Your life offered to the Lord is a pleasing sacrifice to him. It's a spiritual act of worship. Even in your imperfections and your failures, your doubts, your struggles, 
It's a pleasing sacrifice to God. As we say, Lord, take, what, take my life. Use me as you will. And know that in the kingdom of God, he can make something of your life. It's our act of worship to him. As we end our time here, I want to invite the worship team to make their way back up. And just want to end with a reminder. For some of you, maybe you're here today and you feel perhaps guilt, maybe shame. Maybe you came in with an idea that thought your life is insignificant or you couldn't possibly ever make a difference in someone's life. Maybe some of you feel the burden of a family member who's gone astray from the Lord. Someone you've been praying for for years and years and years and you think, Lord, what have I done wrong? Maybe in your own heart, like the nation of Israel, you have found yourself wandering and drifting away. But you're here today. Maybe by choice, maybe by accident. Maybe because the person who you're hanging out with was driving here and you had nothing to say about it. But you're here today. And God wants to speak peace and freedom into your life this morning. God wants to remind you that you are significant. That your life matters. Your background matters. Your history matters. That you make a difference in the kingdom of God. And there's freedom in that because ultimately the job is God's, not yours. And as we end and move into worship, one last song here, I never want to end without giving you that hope that this ultimately comes from Jesus because he knew that we would fail. He knew that we would experience our doubts. He knew that we'd have the times when we say things we didn't mean to say. We make decisions that might draw pe- push people away. And in those moments, Jesus stepped in because of that. He is strong where we are weak. And ultimately, this all because of what Jesus has done on the cross, he's given us freedom and gives freedom to all. It's available, that forgiveness, that life in Christ. And we want to be people who have our lives built on that foundation of Jesus. And as we do that, your life in the kingdom will matter. Under the palm trees of life, and sometimes the weird, unique things like the tent pegs. God will use your life and make it matter. Let's pray. Stand with me as we pray. God, we thank you so much. And we stand before you, Lord, wanting to present ourselves as living sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to you, God. And Lord, we present ourselves knowing that we present ourselves as flawed, broken people with doubt, with sin, with sometimes self-doubt, maybe not believing that you can work through us. But Lord, all we can do now is trust that you are God and that you are who you say you are. So Lord, receive our lives in this place. This sacrifices to you. And Lord, use us how you will as you work in and through and around us to make a difference in this world, Lord. We want your heart. We want you to shine. So take us as broken vessels made whole because of you and do what you will with us in this place. We thank you and give you this time now in Jesus' name. Amen.